All right. So last time we talked a little bit about fiber optic transmitters, right? So we're going to start with a quick review of transmitters. We're going to talk about how you're going to test your transmitters once they're all built. And then we're going to talk about the other half of your communicator kit, the receivers, OK? So let's get started with a quick review of the transmitters. When we talked about the transmitters, we, we looked at the whole schematic. And when we looked at it as a whole, it was kind of complicated, right? There was a lot of pieces going different ways. But we said that we could break it down into smaller parts, stages. And the stages, each stage was a little bit easier to understand than the, the circuit as a whole, right? Each stage had only a few parts in it, so it was easier to understand. And if you could understand each stage by itself, then you could start to understand how they worked with each other. And once you understand how the stages work with each other, it starts to become more clear how the whole circuit it, uh, uh, functions. So let's talk about the stages. I'm not going to draw out the whole schematic again. You guys have that in your lab books, so you can refer to that. But I'm going to just talk about the stages this morning, OK? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the components in them as well. So what was the first stage for our transmitter? Yeah, power. The, um, we started off with power so that we could have energy for the entire board. So we had a power stage. And what were some of the components in that power stage? Battery, exactly. That's where the energy came from. What else do we have? Switch. Yeah, a switch to turn the power on and off. And what else? LED. An LED, exactly, to tell us when the power was on and when it was off. The resistor also. Yeah, yeah, and the resistor limited the current through the LED so that we were not using, uh, well, first of all, so we didn't burn up the LED and also so that we didn't use too much of our power just on an indicator. Okay? So that was our power stage. That was the first thing that we used and that provided the power for the rest of our circuit. Right? So what was our next stage? Input. Input, exactly. So we came over here and we had an input stage. And what was the purpose of the input stage? Collect information. Yeah, collect information. What type of information did it collect? What was coming in? Sound. Sound, Sound exactly. And so it did. It processed the sound, and then what type of signal did it send out? Electrical. Yeah, an electrical signal, a voltage signal. So. The input stage measured sound and turned it into voltage. How, what was the um, what was the component that measured the sound? Microphone. Yeah, microphone. So there was a microphone in there, um, and that was connected in a voltage divider configuration, right, with another resistor. So the, the microphone and the resistor formed a voltage divider. And when the sound hit the microphone, the microphone resistance changed a little bit. So if you had a 1 kilohertz um, sound hitting your microphone, the resistance of the microphone would change at a 1 kilohertz rate, 1,000 times per second. So the resistance would fluctuate up and down just a tiny bit a thousand times a second if you were listening to a one kilohertz tone. So now the, the voltage that was coming out of this input stage, was that a big voltage or a small voltage? Yeah, it was a, a small signal. The microphone is, is changing a thousand times a second, but it's only changing a little bit, right? So the signal coming out is pretty small. 
So what do we have to do to that signal to make it um, into something that we can use? Amplify it. Amplify it, right. So the next stage is the amplifier stage. And this takes a small voltage in, and it turns it into a large voltage going out. So what was the chip that was responsible for the amplification here? Oh, man. Yeah. It was an operational amplifier, or an op amp chip. This one in particular was the 741, which is a kind of a standard op amp chip. And this chip was um, connected in a particular type of circuit. It was connected in a, an inverting amplifier type of circuit. And we said that the inverting amplifier had two resistors which together set the gain, right? There is a feedback resistor and an input resistor. And we will talk more about op amps later in the course, so um, don't worry if it's not 100% clear right now, but when we, when we hook up the op amp in the inverting amplifier configuration, then the gain is equal to the feedback resistor divided by the input resistor. In our case, the feedback resistor was 100 kilo ohms and the input resistor was 10 kilo ohms. So what was our gain? Mm -hmm. 10. <coughs> yeah. That means that the output signal was 10 times bigger than the input signal. So if we had a signal coming in that was one millivolt peak to peak, how much voltage peak to peak would we have going out? Well, we have a gain of 10, that means that the output is 10 times bigger than the input. So if the input is one millivolt, the output would be 10 millivolts, right? If the input were two millivolts, how big would the output be? 20 millivolts, exactly. Um, so, so that's what this gain means. It means that the, this is how much the signal gets amplified, okay? We could have chosen different resistors and gotten a different gain, but um, with the particular configuration that we have, we have a gain of 10. Okay. All right, so we've amplified our signal, and that brings us to the last stage in our circuit. What was the last stage? The output, the output exactly. So this takes a large voltage coming in, and it turns it into what? Light. Light, exactly. And um, what type of component actually created the light? Mirror. LED. Yeah, an LED. So this was a special LED. We want an infrared light, so this is an infrared LED. Remember, LEDs create light in a particular um, spectrum. So you could have red light or blue light or green light. In this case, the LED has been tuned to the infrared spectrum, so it produces infrared light. Okay. So we had an LED. And what component controlled the amount of current that was flowing through the LED? Transistor, exactly. So the transistor was was a device that looked like this, or the schematic for it looked like this. And um, we had the collector up here the base and the emitter. And we said that a small amount of current coming into the base 
allowed a large amount of current to flow from the collector to the emitter. So if you increase the amount of current coming into the base, you increase the amount of current flowing through the collector and the emitter. And we had our LED up here. So if you increase the amount of current flowing through the LED, what happens to the amount of light coming out? Yeah, it increases also. So the more current you have, the more light you get. So by increasing the amount of current, you can increase the light, and vice versa. If you decrease the amount of current, you decrease the amount of light coming out. So this transistor and LED combination turns a a small voltage signal into a a light signal. Okay. Yeah. So that must be a variable transistor. Though. Well, I think some of them are just on or off. Well, so transistors can be used in different ways. So they can be used as switches, almost like you're talking about. So, so you can, if you put a, a big amount of current into the base, then they act pretty much like a wire, um, almost like a straight wire. So that'd be like a closed switch. If you put no current into the base, then they act like an open circuit or an open switch. So. Sometimes they're used as switches like that. And they're actually most efficient in, in those two cases, um, when they're either all the way open or all the way closed. So oftentimes they're used as switches. But they can be used in this other uh, analog way as well, where the you don't put in a ton of current and you don't put in no current. You put in you know some current, somewhere in between. And when you do that, the transistor acts like a variable resistor. So it, it either increases or decreases its resistance um, depending on how much current comes into the base. So I think they're, they're kind of replacing relays, right? Oftentimes, yeah, transistors are used in place of relays. Relays, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, relays are mechanical switches which are electrically controlled. So you put a um, an electrical signal into a relay, and that causes a mechanical switch to close. So that can, um, you can have a small amount of current coming in to the relay, and that can close a big switch and allow a large amount of current to flow through the relay. And this can be very useful. It can be used to control, you know, for a, a small amount of current to control a really big thing, like a big motor, a big um, actuator, and, big current, right? But the relay has some drawbacks. It's actually a mechanical thing that's going back and forth, so that can wear out over time. Um, it can cause a small amount of sparking when the contacts close, and there can be a little bit of a bounce when they hit each other. So it, there can be some sort of on and off um, fluctuations when the relays are first closed. So they have some advantages, but some drawbacks as well. Whereas, I'm sorry? They're also loud. Yeah, they can be loud, especially big ones. Um, <clears throat> whereas a transistor can do a, a lot of the same things. You can have a small amount of current controlling a large amount of current, but there's no moving parts inside of a transistor. A transistor is uh, just a block of silicon. And so there's nothing to move. It's just all controlled um, through the... the uh, sort of the movement of the electrons inside the silicon thing. And so this is called a solid state device. Okay, It's solid. It's, it's literally a solid block of silicon. Um, so there's no moving parts. So if you've heard of solid state devices, they're talking about devices based entirely on transistors with no moving electrical uh, contacts. Yeah? But in this application, this transistor is acting more like a Variable potentiometer yeah. or a light control. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's okay. it's acting more like a, a dimmer switch on a wall. That's a great way to, to say it. Or yeah, a variable resistor. So um, it's not all the way on, it's not all the way off, it's it's somewhere in between. So if there's no current coming into the base, it's sort of halfway on. If we add a little bit more current, it goes up a little bit, and then a little less current brings the, the light down. 
So that way we can have the, the greatest amount of fluctuation possible. We can go all the way up to full brightness or all the way down to full dimness, but most of the time it's sort of halfway on. Okay? Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Uh, where does the current going into the base exit? It flows from the base through the emitter, yeah, down to ground. Um, so the base current <coughs> flows there, and then that allows, so it, it only requires a small amount of current flowing in there, and that allows a large amount of current coming from the collector to flow down through the emitter to ground. What if there's no current coming from the collector? Will it go the, the opposite way? No. Um, if, if there was no, nothing connected up here? Yeah, or let's just say there was nothing coming. Yeah. Well, there's so no so what happens is that um, if you have a voltage up here mm -hmm. and you allow some current to flow in through the base, then that will allow the current to flow through the uh, collector to the emitter. What if so you don't have voltage up there? Right, so if you had no voltage up there, then the current would just flow from the base to the emitter and... Um, no, it wouldn't go back up the other No, it would, side. it would not go up the other side. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So that was what I wanted to say about the transmit. The a quick <laughs> overview, um, we started with a power supply that created the energy for the rest of our circuit. Our input stage took sound and turned it into a small voltage signal. Then the amplifier took the small voltage signal and um, increased its size to make a large voltage signal. Then our output turned our large voltage into light. So these stages are the same types of stages that you might find in any sort of transmitter. Um, any type of transmitter is going to have a power stage. Anything is going to have an input stage. Now, the, the exact nature of the input stage might change a little bit. right? In our case, we're turning sound into voltage. But if you were looking at a modem, this might turn computer data into voltage. Um, if you were looking at, um, say, a, a transmitter that was you know, measuring the the, the seismic activity, for instance, it could turn a, um, a, a movement into voltage. But in any case, the transmitter is going to have an input stage which turns some external signal into a voltage. Okay? And then most transmitters will have an amplifier which takes the small input voltage and increases its size. And then they'll all have an output. Again, the, the nature of the output might change, right? We're turning voltage into light. If you were talking about a radio transmitter, you'd be turning voltage into a radio signal. Um, but they're going to have some kind of output stage. Um, if you were talking about a radio transmitter for one of those big antennas, you know, that, that's transmitting a, a broadcast radio station like you hear on FM or something, um, then the output would be going to a, a really, really big antenna. And you might have several amplifier stages to get from a small voltage coming out of the, you know, the CD player in the DJ booth and getting it up larger and larger and larger until it has, you know, a megawatt or whatever it needs to transmit through that huge antenna. You might have several amplifier stages, but um, in any case, you would, you would still need to amplify the voltage. Okay? So these are the same types of stages that you might find in any transmitter that you're looking at. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Cool. So let's take a minute now and talk about testing your transmitter. Okay. Once you guys are done building your transmitters, you want to test them and make sure that they're working correctly. Right? So let's talk about how we're going to do that.
we're going to be using our oscilloscope to do this. So when you are ready to test out your transmitter, you're going to go and check out an oscilloscope probe that looks like this. And you're also going to check out a set of power supply leads that look like this. Okay? You're going to use the power supply to provide the power for your circuit. We're not, we don't give out the batteries. You can get a battery for yourself if you want one. But when we're in the lab, we're going to use the power supply to connect to your, uh, your battery terminals. So you just set the power supply to 9 volts um, and then clip the little leads onto the terminals for the, where the battery would ordinarily go. And then that should power up your, uh, your transmitter no problem. Okay? So you're going to get those leads and then you're going to uh, attach them to your transmitter. You're going to plug the power supply leads into the, uh, you know, you're going to clip them onto the battery uh, spots and then you're going to take your oscilloscope leads and you're going to clip onto these little test points here. You guys see there's this, uh, there are these little things that look like tiny brass flags that stick out of your board. So one is labeled TP, test point, and you're going to grab onto that with one lead from the oscilloscope with the, the test lead there. And then you're going to grab onto the ground lead with the little alligator clip from your oscilloscope. Okay? So you're going to attach your oscilloscope to your board like that. Any questions about that? Yeah? Are we supposed to solder those in? Yes, you should solder in the test point and the ground lead to your board. Okay. Um, okay. So once you've got the connections made to your board, we're going to start using the oscilloscope to test this out. is going to transmit the signal that's coming from the microphone. In the test mode, the board will transmit the signal that is coming, or it, it's going to transmit a one kilohertz test tone, which is a square wave. Okay? So right now I've got the board in test mode. And um, I'm looking at the signal, and um, when I look at it, it's it's kind of off the screen here. Okay? So I have to zoom out. So now I can see my signal, but it's moving back and forth. Why would it be moving back and forth like that? Uh, it's a trigger. Yeah, the trigger level is not in the right place. Remember, the, the trigger level is over here, and <coughs> Where does that trigger level have to be in order to make our signal uh, hold still? Yeah, it has to be between the top and the bottom of the signal, right? Right now, the trigger level is down here below the signal, so it's not um, forcing the signal to hold still. So in order to fix that, I have to reset my trigger level. So I'm going to come up here. I'm going to look in. Um, in this area that says trigger there, and I'm going to use the knob that's in the trigger area. And I'm going to move that knob until my trigger level is between the top and the bottom of my signal. And that um, causes the signal to, to hold still or, or be mostly steady on my screen. Okay? So that's looking better there. Now, 
So now I can see that I'm getting a nice good uh, square wave out of my board. So I can tell that the test part of my board is working pretty well. Okay. So now I want to test the board in the normal voice mode. Okay. So I'm going to come and switch the. Uh, I'm going to flip the switch and move it over to the voice mode. You can see that that square wave goes away. That's fine. Now if I tap the microphone, you can see that the signal is moving around a little bit. So I can, I can tell that something's going on there, right? But I'm not really getting a clear picture of what's happening. So I need to make a couple of adjustments on my oscilloscope to see what's happening more clearly. Is it too zoomed in for that? That's exactly right. Yeah, it's too zoomed in in the horizontal direction. Right. So um, we're we're seeing just a little little tiny thing. We need to zoom out to see the bigger picture. So I'm going to come over here, um, and I'm going to turn my horizontal scale um, in this direction, and. Um, Now we can look at the indicator at the bottom of the screen, and this is saying one second. Okay, so that means one second per division. And if you watch the the uh, line going across the screen, you can see that it's taking about one second to go across each square. Okay, so this is one second per division. So now if I tap the microphone, you can see that um, we're, we're getting definitely large changes in the signal. Okay? So that's, that's good. So I can see that something's going on there. But what I'd really like to see is the sound of my voice, what my voice looks like on the <coughs> microphone. So if I speak in here, I can say test, 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 and I can see that something's going on there, right? But that's kind of a small signal, right? I'd like that to be really, really big and prominent on my screen. <coughs> so, what can I do to make that bigger on the screen? Come back out and make that like half a second or slower. Yeah. So, so that would definitely stretch it out in the horizontal direction. What about in in the vertical direction? I could probably zoom in there also, right? So, I can start turning this knob, and I can. That zooms in, so now if I do test, 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 the signal looks a little bit bigger on the screen, but I'd like it to be even bigger still. I'd like it to fill up almost the whole screen from top to bottom. But if I zoom in any more, what happens is that now my signal, I, I've zoomed in so far that my signal has gone off the top of the screen, right? So I need to do something <coughs> to allow me to keep zooming in on this signal um, without it going off the top of the screen. So what I can do is I can use something called AC coupling. Okay. Right now, I'm using DC coupling. Okay. So I'm going to zoom back out a little bit. First of all, let's, let's understand a little bit more about this signal. What is the average so voltage of this signal? That's something I'd like to know. Um, I can see that we have one volt per division. Down, I'm sorry, one volt per division, according to, to this uh, indicator here. So I've got one, two, three and a half, call it almost four uh, divisions there. So that's that's going to be somewhere between three and four volts uh, average for my signal, right? So. What I'm doing is that when I zoom in, um, if I if I zoom in on, well, and, and then the other thing I want to know is where is where is zero for my signal, right? Zero is wherever this little arrow is indicated. So um, this little one with this arrow means that zero volts for my signal is right here. So it's, it's pretty much in the middle of the screen right now. So when I'm zooming in, I'm sort of zooming in on this, this zero level. Okay? 
but my signal has a three and a half volt offset. So what's happening is that um, with DC coupling, I see the signal exactly as it is. So I see the little wiggles in the signal that happen when I, when I speak into the microphone, and I also see the three and a half volt average um, offset there. That's with DC coupling. AC coupling gets rid of the average uh, of my signal, okay? So it only allows the small wiggles, the changes, the AC part of the signal to come through. So right, at, right now, up here at the top of the screen, it says DC coupling. So if I push this button, it's going to change to AC coupling, and then that should get rid of the average of the signal. So you can see it's the average of the signal was up here, and then it, it got rid of that, and it, it centered the signal around zero. Okay? Now, the, if I say test, 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 you can see that I, I still have the um, AC part of the signal coming through, but the DC part went away. So now I can zoom in on my signal, and I can keep on zooming in, and the signal still stays right in the middle of the screen because there's no DC offset. Right? Okay, so now I say test, test, test. It's getting bigger. I can zoom in a little bit more. Say test, test, test. And it's starting to fill up almost the entire screen. Okay? So, and then um, we could zoom in a little bit more in the, um, the horizontal direction as well. Let's say test, 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 <laughs> test. So test, 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 test. So what you're going to do is you're going to um, you're going to set up your scope like this. You're going to speak into the microphone and get a nice um, reading on your screen. And then you're going to push this run stop button at the top right corner of your oscilloscope. And this is going to pause the oscilloscope. So you can capture the current uh, picture on the screen. And then you're going to draw that picture in your lab book. So you're going to draw what your voice looks like in your lab book. Okay? And then I'll come around and, and sign you off. So that's how you, you're going to test out your transmitter. Okay? <coughs> so any questions about that? And you're going to do a similar sort of thing to test out your receiver once your receiver is built. So let's talk about that for a minute. Your receiver does not have the test points on it like the transmitter does, but what your receiver has is this speaker. Okay. So the speaker has um, these two little connections on the back where you solder the, wa the wires on. Okay, so, yeah, this is not working very well. So let's flip this around. So your speaker has these two connection points there and there where you soldered the wire on. And you're going to connect your oscilloscope to those points. Okay. Um, you're just going to do your best to clip on to whatever you can find there. You clip on the probe on one side and the ground lead on the other side. Okay. And that's that's what you're gonna do. And then you're gonna turn on your 
you're going to turn on your transmitter and your receiver so that they can work together. And together, you're going to use them to test out your receiver. your receiver is that you're going to put your transmitter in the uh, test mode and it's going to create that awful screeching noise. Okay? And so this is going to create a big signal on your oscilloscope. You're going to uh, zoom way in on that signal in the horizontal direction so that you can actually see it. And then you're going to um, decrease the size a little bit and then you're going to hit the run stop button again so that you can turn off that god awful screeching. Okay? Um, and then you should see a signal that looks kind of like this on your screen. And, and that means that your receiver has been able to get the signal from the transmitter and turn the light into a voltage signal and then play it out through the speaker. Okay. Can it be a square? Well, it came over as a square wave, but then um, we turned on the AC coupling and that sort of got rid of some of the, the squareness of it. And then the, um, the speaker itself um, evens out some of the, the squareness. So it, it gets rid of that as well. So, so it started off as a square wave, but it got changed a little bit. So it, don't worry if it doesn't look like a square wave on your, your screen. All right, so that's how you're going to test out your transmitter and your receiver. Any questions about that? Yeah? Uh, can you, uh, if it doesn't work, can you uh, figure out what's wrong with it? Yes. Yeah, so if it doesn't work, then you get to do some troubleshooting, which is uh, an important skill to have. Um, and yeah, you, you should probably call me or one of the other uh, help us over to, to take a look and we can start going through it and figuring out which signals are supposed to be at which points and, and try and work out what's going on. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Since there are the infrared LEDs mm -hmm. open and exposed, everything is not going down the fiber optic cable. That's right. So is that loss uh, something to be concerned with in you know, real world application? Yes. Uh, so, so you would put some kind of sleeve on there to encapsulate it. And yeah. Yeah. Exactly. These are these are hobby boards, so you know we're not real concerned about um, loss or, or diversions. But the more of the light you can get to go down the fiber optics, the better off you're going to be. The more signal you get um, from one side to the other. So. In, in real world applications, they would be very concerned about it. They would put shielding around it. They would put, you know, reflectors to make sure that all the light is going where it's supposed to be and not escaping. There are a few things that you guys can do to improve the quality of your signal. Um, you can align the cable and the, um, the LED as much as possible on the transmitter side, and then the cable and the uh, transistor on the receiver side. So you want the sensor to be pointed straight down the barrel of the cable, just like the LED should be pointed straight down the barrel of the cable. Also, you can improve the ends of the fiber optic cable itself. When the cable comes from the factory, the ends are sort of chewed up. They're kind of ragged, and um, that causes the light to sort of diverge and deflect and um, it's not ideal. We actually have a, a small cutter which creates a very nice, very flat end on your cable. So when you are uh, ready to install your cable, you can ask me or one of the other helpers for the fiber optic cutter and we'll come over and we'll just trim the end off of your cable, give you a nice flat edge and that should help to 
have as much light as possible go down that cable, okay, and not be scattered around. So those are a couple things that you can work on. Yeah, other questions? Okay, cool. So let's talk about the receiver for a little while, okay? We talked about the transmitter, and we talked about the different stages of the transmitter. So let's talk about the stages of the receiver. A diagram of the receiver. You have this in your lab books and in the instruction manuals for your uh, kits. So the receiver has stages just like the transmitter has stages. So let's talk about those. The first stage is over here. It has a battery and a switch and an indicator. Anybody want to guess what this stage is? Power. Power stage, that's right. So just like in the transmitter, the power stage provides all of the power for your the rest of your circuit. It's got these long wires that come out that feed the other components. So this is providing power to the rest of the circuit. Now, the power stage in the receiver has one extra component that was not present in the transmitter, and that's this capacitor, okay? And the reason for this is that the receiver has to power up a speaker, and a speaker is sort of a, a big load. It, it requires, it can require a lot of electricity, and sometimes it requires that electricity in a a big burst, like if you you make a loud noise all of a sudden, like a snapping noise or something like that, then the speaker has to move suddenly, and and it takes a lot of electricity to get it to make that sudden movement. So what's happening is that this capacitor acts like a reservoir for electricity. Okay, so the battery charges up this capacitor, and then if the speaker needs to move quickly, it can draw down some of the, the power that's been stored in the capacitor, okay? So it, it can, um, if it needs a quick burst of energy, it can take a little bit of the charge that was put into this capacitor, and then when it doesn't need quite as much energy anymore, the battery goes back and recharges this capacitor so that it's ready to be used again. So this capacitor is acting like a reservoir in this case, okay? Any questions about the power stage? Okay. Now, the next stage is over here. And this is our input stage. So the main component in the input stage is this thing right here. This looks like a component that we saw in our transmitter. Anybody know what this looks like? Transistor. Transistor, exactly. So I should have drawn a little arrow there. Um, but there is one important <coughs> difference between this transistor and the transistor that we saw before. Remember, the transistor we saw last time had three inputs. Uh, terminals, right? It had a collector, an emitter, and a base. This one has the collector and the emitter, but there's no wire attached to the base. Instead, there's this little arrow pointing in. Looks kind of like the little arrow on the LED, right? What did the arrow represent on the LED? Light. 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 And it represents the same thing over here. So this is something called a phototransistor. It acts in a similar way to a transistor, but instead of being controlled by 
current, it's controlled by light. So the amount of light hitting this thing controls how much current flows from the collector to the emitter. The more light you get in, the more current you have. Okay? So, so this is the receiver part which is pointing down the barrel of your fiber optic cable. This is the part that detects the light signal that's coming from your transmitter. Okay? And it, it essentially causes the transistor to change its resistance. Okay? And, and that creates a small voltage signal here at this resistor. Now this resistor, this component looks like a resistor, but it's got this extra leg coming out. Anybody know what this is? It's a potentiometer. Yeah, it's, it's a potentiometer. Um, so let's talk for a few minutes about potentiometers and what they are and how they work. Okay, and then we can hopefully figure out what this thing is doing for us. So, A potentiometer um, is essentially a, a resistor, a long strip of resistive material that has one connection at the top and one connection at the bottom. And if you were to measure the resistance from the top to the bottom, it would always be constant. It might be you might have a one kilo ohm potentiometer, so then you would always measure one kilo ohm resistance between the top and the bottom. But, so, so that represents the top leg and the bottom leg of this component in the diagram. But the third leg is this, this um, wiper that can be attached at, at various points along the potentiometer. And, and you can move it up and down this strip of resistive material. Okay? So, if you measure the resistance between the top and um, the wiper when it's right in the middle, you would see half of the total resistance of the whole uh, resistor. So if this were a one kilo ohm potentiometer and the wiper were right in the middle, and you measure from the top to the middle, you'd see 500 ohms of resistance. Okay? If this wiper were, you know, 90% of the way up, you would see um, only 10% of the resistance between the top and there, and so on. So, let's, let's think about what would happen if you, um, if you put a signal in at the top. So, say you've got this big voltage signal up at the top, and down here at the bottom, you have ground. You've got um, no signal at all. So up here at the top, you've got a, a big voltage signal. Down at the bottom, you've got no signal. If you were to attach this wiper up at the top of your potentiometer, then the signal that you would see on your wiper would be exactly the same as the input, right? Because you, you've attached this to, to the input, right? So you would get the same signal up there. If you were to move the potentiometer wiper all the way down to the bottom, then that would be like attaching it to the bottom. And at the bottom, there's no signal, right? So, so down here, you would see a, a signal which was totally flat, zero volts, okay? If you were to move this wiper somewhere in the middle, then you would get a signal that was sort of half as big as the, the top, right? It would, it would be still the same sort of signal, but it would be smaller, right? It would be sort of half of this and, and half of that, so it would be it would be small, right? So we're using this potentiometer 
and we're creating a, a voltage signal with our um, our transistor here and we're able to move the potentiometer up and down um, to get either a bigger signal or a smaller signal. So what would be another name for for this potentiometer uh, in, in this case? What are we using this potentiometer for? Volume control. Volume, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. If we turn the knob in one direction, we get a bigger signal, we get more volume. If we turn the knob the other way, we get a smaller signal, or, or almost down to nothing, and we get less volume. So this knob is our, this, this is our, our volume control. In this case, it is a knob. It's the same idea, but the potentiometer, or the, the resistive material has been wrapped around in a circle so that we could turn a knob and, and move the wiper that way. Um, but but that's, that's the idea there. Okay. So, so we've got our input stage, which has a, a phototransistor, which detects the light coming in, and also a volume knob to change the size of the signal that's coming out. And then our next stage over here is our amplifier stage. So this takes the signal coming from our input and increases the size. The chip that's doing the heavy lifting here is an LM386 um, which is an audio amplifier. This is a chip that's specifically designed for powering speakers. So it, it takes a small signal coming in and it increases the size and it can produce a significant amount of current in order to power our speakers. The speakers really do require a lot of uh, power, which includes current and voltage. So the amplifier here needs to be able to provide both current and voltage. The 741 that we saw on the transmitter provides a bigger voltage, but it doesn't supply much current. And that was okay for our, our transmitter because it didn't really require much. But in this case, we need something that can provide current and voltage. Okay. So that's the 386 there. And then our final stage is our output. Okay. So the output, the, the main component of the output is this speaker. So have you guys, we haven't really talked about how speakers work before. So let's take a minute and talk about speakers, okay? So the purpose of a speaker is to create sound. And we said that sound is really vibrations in the air, fluctuations in the pressure in the air. So the speaker has to create these uh, vibrations in the air. So the way that it does that is that it has this, this cone of paper or rubber that moves back and forth. Okay? So if you were to look at a speaker from the side, you would see that it has sort of a metal housing like this. And then inside the metal housing, there is a, a cone of, of paper or rubber or something like that, plastic material, that can move back and forth. So the question is, how do we get it to move back and forth? How do we get it to do what we want? Well, what happens is that there's, there's a magnet a big permanent magnet on the back of our speaker and it's got a, a north pole here and a south pole there and then 
there's a coil of wire that's attached to the back of our speaker cone. Okay? So if we were looking at this from the front, we would see something like this. We, we've got a big uh, circular cone, and uh, we've got these wires attached, and they make a big spiral of wire on the back of our cone. Okay? So if we were, and then it goes something like that, if we were to look at it from the side, um, the wires would be attached here, and they'd be making the, the um, big coil of wire right on the back of our cone. Okay? So you guys know what happens when you put electricity through a wire, right? What is that, through a coil of wire? What does that coil of wire become? An electromagnet, exactly. So what happens is that when we push the electricity through our coil of wire in one direction, we get a south pole over there and a north pole over there. And the south pole of our electromagnet is attracted to the north pole of our permanent magnet. And so that causes the speaker cone to move backwards towards our permanent magnet. Now, if we were to reverse the direction of the electricity flowing through the coil, then that reverses the poles of our magnet. So now we have a north pole over here and a south pole there, and now the, the similar poles repel each other. So that forces the cone out. So by switching the direction of the electricity back and forth like this, we can cause the cone of our speaker to move back and forth. And if we, if we do that at a high speed, the cone moves back and forth at a high speed, and it causes these vibrations in the air. And that's what we hear and interpret as sound. OK? Yeah? What's uh, causing the current to switch? Well, that's what's coming out of our, um, our amplifier here. So, okay. so we're getting. Um, fluctuations in the light coming in, right? It's going um, brighter, dimmer, brighter, dimmer, brighter, dimmer, like that. And then that's causing small fluctuations in our voltage here, and we're amplifying those. And then that's turning into um, small changes in the amount of current that is going into the speaker. So um, it's going, the current is, is going forward, backwards, forwards, backwards, and, and flowing in different directions through the, the speaker cone like that. What's the uh, capacitor there for? So, yeah, so this, what happens is that capacitors allow AC signals to pass through them, but they block DC, or, or constant signals, okay? So, we are trying to send the, the small changes into our speaker. So, so the small changes in voltage that represent the sound, we want to send those into our speaker so they can go through the capacitor without much trouble. But we don't want to send any constant signals into our speaker. It's like a filter. Exactly, it is a filter. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly what it. It's called a filter capacitor, in oh. fact. So yeah, that's exactly right. It allows some of the signal to go through the AC part, but it blocks other parts, the the DC part. Um, and and so the reason that we don't want the DC part going into our speaker, well, there's a couple reasons. First of all, it would be wasteful, right? We'd be sending a lot of power through our speaker. And remember, the speaker is just a big coil of wire. So if you had a DC voltage over here, it'd be like trying to put a, a voltage across a wire. That, that wire does not present much resistance to a DC signal, so it would be using up a lot of energy. So that would be wasteful. And then also, if you put a lot of current through a speaker, through a wire like that, the wire starts to heat up. So that could, um, it could be dangerous for us, and it could uh, damage the speaker over time. So 
for those reasons, we want to try and keep the DC out of our speaker while we let the AC go through so that we can hear the sound. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So, with our speaker, we have the, the power stage here. This is a recap. Which the power stage provides the energy for the whole thing. We have this capacitor which acts as a reservoir to, um, to supply any power surges that we need in order to run the speaker. We have our input stage where we have a phototransistor that detects the light and a potentiometer that acts as a volume knob. Then we have our amplifier stage which um, takes our small input signal and increases the size and provides the current and the voltage that we need for our output stage, which is mostly the speaker, but also includes this filtering capacitor to allow the AC through and block out the DC. So our receiver takes a light signal, turns it into a voltage signal, and then turns the voltage signal into sound that we can hear. So it's kind of the opposite of our transmitter, right? Our transmitter took sound, turned it into voltage, and then turned it into light. Here we're taking light, turning it into voltage, and then turning it into sound. So, yeah. Any questions about that? Okay, well that's what I wanted to say. So let me uh, take roll, and then I'll let you guys go.